My name's Louise and I ended up going for the genetic test for FTD because in 1998 when I was 18 my dad was diagnosed and at that consultation he told me that they knew that there was a link to genetics but they couldn't pinpoint where the mutation was so at some point in the future I could possibly be tested for it. My dad had got it from his mum. His mum's sister had also been described as, and obviously back in the 1980s, people didn't really have that awareness of FTD. So actually my, my dad's mum was sectioned because people thought that she was eccentric and very young to be eccentric and very young to be doing the things that she was doing and too young to almost have Alzheimer's. Her mum had been classified and regarded as, as eccentric so the story was coming down through the family that it looked like most people had contracted FTD. So when I kind of stopped and thought about it like that, I thought my chances of coming out of this unscathed are quite unlikely. I've probably got it as well. So at that point then I started to think I probably have got it and it's probably better to prepare myself for having the gene. I'm Sophie and um, my mum had Alzheimer's at a young age. We didn't realise at the time that's necessarily what it was and my auntie did as well. Um, I really struggled when mum was ill. I found it very difficult to cope with that um, and during that time we became aware that what was happening to my mum and my auntie um, was probably genetic, um, which really sort of knocked me for six, I think. I had um, a little girl, she was really small at the time, she was my baby, and the realisation that this was something that might happen to me and might happen to my daughter if it happened to me um, was really, really hard, and I think I didn't cope with that very well at all. The certainty of knowing was more important than the possible impact a negative result could have, well, a bad result could have for me. So it was, it was a case of, well, we'll cross that bridge when we come to it. If we need to, I have to find out because I think about it all the time. It's in my head all the time. I used to test myself almost. I used to not write things down to just see if I could remember them. And then if I forgot them, I'd think to myself, <gasps> this could be it. You were, I was, sometimes I'd kind of be anticipating, was it a sign, wasn't it a sign? Was it starting to happen, wasn't it? Because my dad was 36 when um, he was, so he's my age now. I didn't want to be spending the rest of my life guessing and anticipating when actually I might not even have it. <laughs> so it would just be a waste of life to be worrying about something that might not even be. It's constantly there eating away at me. And it, and it will impact how I live the rest of my life from this moment on, so I've got to find out. For, for me, deciding to get tested was to give me certainty one way or the other. I was definitely not doing things with my life because I believed that I was going to get Alzheimer's. And I think most people in my situation, the assumption in a self-protective way is that we are going to get it because therefore we've got nothing to lose. We haven't planned a future that we won't have. Um, but I realised that there were things that I wasn't doing because I thought I probably would get Alzheimer's. Um, and how long would I wait before I might believe that I didn't have it? How much older than my mum would I have been before I thought, that's safe, I can go live on a canal boat? Because <laughs> that's what I really wanted to do, on a wide beam canal boat. And I needed to know there was things that I wasn't doing and I was going to find out and I was going to buy a wide beam canal boat and live down in Windsor um, with my dogs and my husband. And I sort of ummed and about it, but I, I always came to the conclusion that this was something that I couldn't do and that I would never be able to do. Um, and then very recently, um, my daughter is older, she's now 18. Um, I have had a very positive experience of being involved in research. I, I became aware that there were things that I wanted to do in my life that I was definitely not doing because I thought I was probably going to get Alzheimer's. I've always assumed that I would get it. And I just realised that I needed to know 
and I just felt completely differently about it and um, and I went to get tested. I think I was so I was so close to the age when my mum became symptomatic that I wasn't going to have this knowledge for you know 10 or 15 years. I was going to know I was going to know that it was going to happen pretty soon, but it would help me to make some life decisions um, along the way. And I and I just needed to know because I felt I could deal with either of the outcomes, um, and I just needed certainty. When I decided that I wanted to go through the genetic counselling process, um, I did speak to other members of my family, and um, in in general, it was quite well accepted. And I think for some other people it was more difficult but I think what happened was everybody accepted that that's what I needed to do at that time even if they felt uncomfortable with it and perhaps thought that it, you know knew that it wasn't something that they would do the the most important thing to me in in making the decision was actually my daughter because if I found out that I had if I had it, then she then knows immediately that she has a 50-50 chance and I know what life is like when you're living knowing that you have a 50-50 chance. And I think what I'm grateful for is that my daughter has seen me being involved in research. She's been down with me for to the hospital when I've had appointments. It's since she was about, I think about 11 or 12, it's been an open conversation in our house. And I spoke to her about it and I, I would never have kept it from her. And I, I said that I was thinking about getting tested. Um, would she want to know? Would she want to know straight away? Would she want me to wait until she'd finished uni? Um, and she was okay with it. and. That made things much easier for me. Um, and I, th I think I'm really grateful for that, that, that she's been involved, she's seen what I've been doing, she knows about the research that's going on. She understood my reasons for wanting to get tested. And I think if she's okay with it, then I'm okay with it. It was a very personal thing. My husband used to get a little bit cross with me because he'd say, but it's not just you. But it was my story, it was my life, and it, it affected my whole life. And it's made me the person that I am now, but I was very much a, of the opinion that, and he, he said, uh, there were points where he said, actually, I don't really want you to go ahead with it. I don't want to know whether or not you've got it. But he said he had to respect that it was my choice because he could understand that I didn't want the same outcome for my children that I'd had to go through with my dad. I think it was um, quite hard for my husband because he's always said, I know you haven't got it, you don't need to get tested because I know you haven't got it. It was quite ha hard to have the conversation with him and tell him that I, that I wanted to be tested. Um, but I, th I think he's really come a long way in that process and I think that the conversations that happened during the periods between the counselling appointments and getting the results have um, really enabled him to face it a little bit more rather than trying to convince himself that there's no way that it was going to happen. Um, and, we, and, you know, we had conversations about what we would do with either result, you know, what things we would change in our lives or, or how it would impact us. Um, so we probably had more conversations, like serious conversations about it in that time of going through the counselling process than we have done in the 14, 15 years of our, of our relationship. Um, and, and that's been a really positive thing to, to open it up as, as something that we can talk about in our house. When we went through this process, it gave me the um, time and almost permission to think about what I would like for me when I become symptomatic if, if I did test positive to the, to the mutation. Um, I was able to make my wishes known, my family know exactly what I want and what I don't want. I um, have got on my, uh, a document on my iPad of how I would like to be cared for and what I would like carers to know about me as I am now so that they can know who I am. Um, and um, putting sort of financial things in place just to make sure that everything was organised um, 
making sure that my husband knows the passwords <laughs> for all of the bank accounts, all of those things. Um, and it just opened up those, those conversations. And I think I've thought about those things for a really long time. I just haven't necessarily had conversations with the people who I need to have conversations with. And um, it's allowed me to prepare, really. In January 2016, I found out that I could be tested and I went to the GP and told him that I'd done all of the research that I needed to. I knew that I could be tested. I wanted to be tested. I'd wanted to be tested since I was 18. And could he refer me to the hospital, which he did. I was very lucky because when we donated mum's um, brain when she died, um, we did that through Queen Square Brain Bank. and. Um, they did the genetic test, they um, asked um, us permission to do the genetic test on that. So they had the details, so the easiest thing for me to do was to get in touch with them and find out what I needed to do. They said that I could be referred um, directly to them. They had all of the details, they knew me and, and my family. And um, I'm very lucky to have an amazing GP who, when I go in and say, this is a crazy situation, can you just refer me to these people? Because they're the people I need to see, he, he did it. Um, I waited, um, I think, a good couple of months before I had my first appointment. And I went to go and see um, somebody at the um, clinical genetics department in Leicester. And she told me that I was right, that I could be tested. However, um, they needed blood from somebody who had had the disease, i.e. my dad, had my dad given any blood in the name of research? Because without my dad's blood, they couldn't pinpoint the exact location where the mutation was. So, and they weren't willing to test me without knowing exactly where they needed to look. If they couldn't pinpoint that mutation, and obviously you can understand that because they could have tested one part and said, oh, it's fine, there's not a mutation there, but the mutation would have been somewhere else. And then I would have lived my life thinking that I hadn't got it when in fact I had. So I understood that need. So then it came down to trying to find out whether or not my dad had ever had any blood taken, which my mum told me he had. Um, and was in storage at the Queen's Medical Centre in Nottingham. So I then had to try and track down my dad's consultant who had been involved in the blood taking process because my mum didn't know exactly where that blood was stored and my dad's consultant had retired. So it was a case of trying to track down people who could help me find what I needed to find. But I did manage to get hold of him. His name was Dr. Komoski, he's a really nice man. And he, um, he told me where it was. So he then liaised with um, the clinical genetics department at Leicester and they got the blood sorted out. And then it was sent off for um, its first round of testing. After the first round of testing, they couldn't locate the mutation. So this was in, at the end of August. So at the end of August, they sent it off for its second round of testing, looking in different locations. And at the end of November, I found out that they had located the mutation, which was on the mapped gene. In the first appointment, I went in and basically explained why I had made the decision now um, to get tested. and why I felt that I was going to be able to handle either of the outcomes of the test and I had I just thought about it really carefully and I think that came across and I think I was probably in there for a good 40 minutes or so on that first appointment. The professor that I saw asked some really fantastic questions. He asked questions more about other people so had I thought about how family members would react, how they would manage that news, um, you know, either way. Um, I'd initially decided that I wanted to get my results on my own, which is not recommended. <laughs> um, and we had quite a good conversation about that and, uh, and we sort of settled on a, uh, on a compromise of having my husband with me, but me being in there on my own to get my results, just so that for that moment I could just feel my feelings and not feel that I needed to make my husband feel better. 
Um, and in the end, I dragged him in <laughs> when I got my results and that was the right thing to do. But it just got me thinking about those things and again, opened up more conversations at home. So my second appointment was at the end of November 2016 when they had located the mutation and um, it was to tell me that they had located the mutation and this time there was, um, as well as the clinical geneticist that I'd seen the first time, there was a, another consultant there um, and they were both trying to ascertain whether or not um, it was the right choice for me, whether or not mentally I was strong enough and capable of dealing with uh, a result whereby I had FTD. The second appointment I went to with my husband, we haven't had that first appointment, I then had the opportunity to have some perhaps different conversations with him and talk about it more, which was getting easier as sort of time went by and we were talking about it more. And then we went to the appointment together. Um, that was very much about how he how he felt about it and and what his understanding of the of whatever the result would be and how that would impact him and whether he truly understood all of the implications of it for him. We were then. Um, asked if we felt that we needed another appointment to come and discuss it. And we could have had more if we felt that we needed more. Um, and I, I think that's really important that people have got as long as they, they feel that they need um, to make the right decision for them. We were okay with what was going on. Um, so we didn't have another follow-up appointment and we made the appointment to get the results um, of the blood tests, which was four weeks later. So I had to go and see a psychiatrist so that he could ascertain whether or not I could withstand um, a result whereby I had the gene. So I went to go and see him. I had to go and see him with my husband so that he could also assess the strength of our relationship and also talk to my husband about how he felt in this process. And um, he asked me a lot of questions about my background and my reasoning and how my future would look and how I would deal with having the gene. Um, he also carried out a mini mental test just to assess whether or not I had capacity at that moment in time to make that decision for myself. Um, and then he wrote up his report and sent it to the geneticist. At the time I went to go and see the psychiatrist, I had to take my husband with me because he also assessed um, the strength of our relationship, <laughs> it appeared, and asked me lots of personal questions about why I wanted to have the test, or asked me what I would do if I received a bad result, how my life would look, that kind of thing. Uh, he also carried out a mini mental just to make sure that I had mental capacity at that moment in time. Um, and then he sent a report back that said everything was fine and in his mind I could uh, withstand the testing results. The wait from them taking my blood, my blood going off for testing um, until the point when we were going to be able to get the results was um, really quite horrific. Not in a, I was petrified of getting the results, but it just took, um, it seemed to take so long at a point where I was absolutely, I think we were both absolutely certain that getting the results was going to be the right thing. and. That was actually the most difficult time. It was kind of the only thing that I could um, I could think about. Like I would wake up thinking about it and I would think about it all day and I'd go to sleep thinking about it. Um, and it was really, really hard. And I think, you know, in the days running up to it, we were just wandering around the house that, you know, if they could have just sent me a text message and told me, <laughs> I was just that ready um, to hear it. And that, that weighing up either option um, constantly was, um, quite draining I think the whole I think that part was very exhausting because I think we were just all thinking about it so much in a self-protective way I wouldn't really allow myself to to think about being told that I that I didn't have it so um so in in that time running up to it 
my focus was always that I was going to sit down and they were going to tell me that I, that I had it. And I think that was just me protecting myself and not allowing myself to think too much about how life could be if I didn't have it. I've never really allowed myself to think about that too much. For me, the worst period actually was that December. So I had the blood test in the February, but that Christmas was a real down point for me. And I couldn't put my finger on why. Um, I don't know whether or not it was the darkness. I felt so lonely. I felt incredibly lonely, incredibly isolated. Um, like nobody could really understand what was going on. And that was the hardest point for me. After that, once, because everything's a what if. So for me, the 7th of March was to be my, well, there's no more what if moments. My whole life has been one what if. You know, the past 18 years of my life have been a what if. So on the, on the 7th of March, it won't be a what if, it's that, okay, I have, or I have not. And that's, and then we can start to, I can start to, I've got that answer, I've got that answer that I've always been looking for, that I've always been searching for. So there was no, there would be no more what if. So I couldn't wait, I just, I couldn't, I couldn't wait. It was almost a kind of a, yeah, I'm going to find out and, and that'll be that. I'd arranged the date when I was going to collect the results as being the day before the Rare Dementia Support Group, which is an annual event. Um, and so I changed the date so that that would, would fit, fit in. Um, and then I knew that I would be able to decide whatever the results, however I was feeling, I could choose if I wanted to be there or not. But it was an option to be with other people who understood um, if, if that was the right thing for me. Um, and I also booked something, uh, a, an immersive dining experience the night that I was getting my results, um, which was quite expensive. And um, on the assumption that if I had the, um, if I had the mutation, um, then we probably wouldn't be, um, be up for going to that. But it was having things there and things that involved um, being with other people rather than sort of you know, if it, if it wasn't the result that I would have liked it to have been, I, would, I wouldn't I would shut myself away. I would be with other people, which I think is generally good in relation to everything that's hard. The day when I was getting my results, I was actually down for a research visit. So I was um, having a drug dose on, the, on that day in the same hospital. Um, we went in, I think I sent my husband out to buy me pastries um, whilst I had my drug infusion. Um, we were very lucky because the appointment of getting the results, there was going to be a few hours gap in between that and I got, um, I was contacted to say if you're going to be done earlier then let me know we can see you earlier, which I, I was kind of dreading this block of two or three hours where I was going to have finished being in the hospital for the drug dose and then had to, to wait to go back to get the results because how was I ever going to think of anything other than that in that time. So um, so we actually went and found out quite early. I had, um, I had a couple of people that I needed to tell hospital-wise for, for the research and I had um, worked out how I was going to tell them in a way that didn't involve me seeing them face to face. And we sat outside in the waiting room for what seemed like ages, but I think probably wasn't ages. And at the time, the plan was that I was going to go in on my own and get my results. And my husband was going to wait outside and they, the nurse was then going to, after I'd had a moment to process whatever the outcome was, um, was going to get him in. And that had been the plan the whole time. And when they called me in, um, I grabbed his hand and we went in together, <laughs> which was the right thing to do. I'm very, very pleased that it went that way. Um, we sat down, we, um, I was told quite quickly, which I was really relieved about. I didn't want to make small, small um, talk or anything. Um, and I was told that I had inherited the gene mutation that my mother had. Um, that would go on to um, cause me to have Alzheimer's um, for me at some time soon. 
Um, I take take a breath. Let's stop for a minute. I um, I kept apologising to my husband. <laughs> Because what I know with this is that it has um, more of an impact on other people than it does on me. At some point, I will be far less aware of what is occurring. But I do know how awful it is to watch someone that you really love. We had some discussions around um, when I would tell my daughter um, and I was, um, I was certain that I was going to tell her as soon as I saw her when, when I got home. Um, and it turned out to be the next day because we got back very late. Um, and then we kind of, there was kind of conversation going on, but I think we were just ready to get out of that room and feel however we felt and I had uh, I had a list of people to to contact um, and how I was going to contact them and who was going to be first and um, there was only a few people on that day and I we went to the pub, got a gin, I made my first couple of phone calls um, and then we just decided what we were going to do with the rest of our day and, and we decided that we were going to um, continue with our plans to go out. Um, we had the conversation, we'd, we were staying in a hotel and I said, are we just going to go and to the hotel and just cry? Um, or are we going to go and do something? And, and we did, we went out, we had a fun night. It's definitely something that we were thinking about during, in, during that time. Um, but we had really good fun and, and I realised that um, I have got time to live and do things and I intend to enjoy my life and have fun along the way. I don't have to give up on, I'm not giving up on my life, I'm going to enjoy my life. And um, and I, the thing that I was conscious of when we went for this, um, this uh, dining experience was at one point I thought I'm not going to remember this or I'm not going to be able to do this and I just had a word with myself and say, you know, just set saying to myself you're not going to get anywhere by thinking that you just need to enjoy things as they are now when you're enjoying them um, and what happens in the future is is for the future and we had a really good night <laughs> when i sat down to go into the waiting room there was a magazine on the side and it was an edition of red just the woman's magazine and I opened it and I was just reading the front page. My husband was sat next to me and I was just reading the inside cover. And there was a woman in there who had written to the editor to thank them for their edition of last month's magazine that had had a section on genetic testing in it. And she had recently received some genetic test results and actually she, ha she carries the gene. So that meant that her life would be impacted on as a carrier of this gene. But it wasn't FTD, I can't remember what it was. And, and at that point, I thought, this is a sign. And she was saying, you know, and, and I have developed an attitude that is a, a positive outlook attitude. This is how I'm going to live my life. And I was so pleased that that came through in your article too. And I was just sitting there thinking, this is a sign. You've got it. You've got it. You've got it. You know, definitely you've got it. And this is how you've got to live your life too, Louise. This is a sign. So I went into the room fully expecting, you've got it. You carry the gene, that's that. And I sat down with my husband and I was holding his hand. And she said, do you still want to receive your result, Louise? And I said, yes, I do. And she said, in that case, I'm pleased to tell you you've not got it. That was it, straight away, just like that and my life was just rewritten. I think I'd always thought that if I got told that I had it, I would literally take to my bed for a couple of weeks and, and, and just stay in my bed and cry. And, and that didn't happen, that surprised me and I wondered if I was broken. Um, 
because I wasn't behaving how I thought I would. Um, I told the most important people. Um, I told my daughter um, and I told other family members and and good friends as well. I went to, I think I told them already, but I went to spend time with them. But I, I think I managed to function quite well. I, I know I had quite morose thoughts, again, looking at the care homes and, and planning. And um, one of the things that I did was on a forum ask people who had someone who was living with dementia or were in the early stages themselves what things would have been helpful for them if they had been done in advance and I actually got some really great tips on there like decluttering having less stuff in your house so that you have less things to lose or get confused about and um, my husband really appreciated me getting rid of loads of things um, and then I think I got quite back to it, it it's, all, it's always been in the back of my mind but I think I got back to normal um, I, I, I do still have my moments um, only a couple of days ago I was having a really good cry about it but it hasn't become more consuming. I, I, I really felt directionless. I just did not know. I felt like I was at a crossroads and and I just didn't know what I was meant to do now, you know? It's almost like you've been, and I'm not religious, but I almost felt like God had spared me and therefore what was I going to do to pay that back? It was really, it was a really strange feeling. But again, incredibly lonely because, and you, guilty. I felt so guilty for feeling almost depressed and almost lost because I hadn't got it. And what about those people who had got the gene and, and why did I feel so rubbish and so down when I should be feeling elated and constantly on cloud nine and, and what was wrong with me? You know, it's really, it's quite a strange, quite a strange place to be really in thinking that you might have it, you've gone through that whole range of emotions. So you are fully, I was fully ready to have it, but I just didn't. So it doesn't mean that, in my head, it didn't mean that I couldn't understand somebody's, for somebody, and also I'd lived that life story. So not only, it wasn't a case of having something that I'd got no comprehension of, I'd, I'd lived that life story. So I'd, I'd known exactly what it, what life would be like had I had the gene, but I just didn't. But I didn't want to talk to anybody about it because I almost felt like I was showing off, but I didn't. But I, but I felt so painful. You know, if I'd met somebody, I would, have, I would have felt their pain for them. Just, it's really, really strange. Before we got the results, we decided that we wanted to book a holiday and it was really important to me that the holiday was booked before the results. So it wasn't a, like a, this is gonna be our last holiday holiday or this is our celebratory holiday. We, we, we were just going on holiday. So we had a lovely um, week in Budapest, literally just a couple of weeks afterwards. And um, that was really brilliant to just be outside of all of the other things that you have to do in normal day-to-day -day life, um, to have fun, to, to relax because I think the whole build up to it had been very emotionally exhausting. Um, and even though I didn't get told that, you know, that I wasn't gonna get Alzheimer's, um, we were able to go away and relax and enjoy each other's company. And for that not to be the entire focus of our thoughts, which is what it had been in the run up. The main thing that I'm, th tell myself is that this always would have happened and I now have a gift of knowing that it's going to happen and being able to do things to make things easier for me and for the people that, that matter to me. Knowing that I had the G mutation probably didn't change too much for me because I think I'd been so prepared for that to be an outcome that I'd done a lot of things already in, in preparation um, for that being the case. It has made me less cautious about doing some things that I probably would have thought, oh no, we'll wait until there's a bit more money in the bank or, or any of those 
those kind of sensible thoughts. Not to a degree where we're going to go bankrupt or anything, but um, but doing the things and having experiences um, and, and spending time with the people that we want to spend time with, I think has been the most important thing. Um, And I and I think I have done sent you know made my wishes known more extensively about what I want and having conversations with um, my husband about future care and what I would find acceptable and what I would not want him to have to do for me. Um, but but they're not they're not a big part of what is going on now. But they are just conversations that are that are taking place. I do feel really lucky because most people, they develop a dementia, they're probably quite symptomatic by the time they've got to the point where anybody is taking them seriously um, and, and potentially giving them a diagnosis of, um, of some form of dementia. And, and then that person has got a partner who has had to fight really hard to, to be heard. That person is, who's affected is potentially past the point of being able to acknowledge what is going on or express their wishes for what they want or being able to do things to make things easier um, for their family and um, and I am able to do that and there there is very few people who have that opportunity there are very few people that get a, a diagnosis so early you know they, they have to fight for it um, so I've been really quite I know it sounds really wrong I feel really lucky that I have that opportunity and I can almost um, prepare my family for, for what is ahead and stupid things like I really struggled to go and visit my mum when she was ill, um, really, really struggled and on the occasions when I would go I would um, just sit and cry and um, I can put down in writing that anybody who's caring for me um, do not ever make my family feel bad about not being there. You know, I, I need you to know how hard this is for them. Um, I will have a sign above my bed that says, if you come and see me and I'm being horrible, go home, I love you. Don't don't put yourself through this. I want you to go home and do something that, that you enjoy. And not very few people have that opportunity to do that. I was able to um, speak um, to my team developer in my work role and say um, she knew that I was going to find out um, and to say that this is the situation um, I, I'm not affected now this isn't anything that is going to change what I do um, in the very near future um, but now we can talk about when that time comes who you can listen to you know I feel like I will tell you when I'm when it's affecting my work, there's a chance that that won't happen. I want you to know that you can listen to this person and that person and that person if they contact you and say that they have concerns about me. And I can put you in touch with people who can help you with how to have a conversation with me about that in the way that is best for the company and also kindest to me. And really nobody has the, the chance to do that and to have had those conversations where I can very much be part of it um, has been really quite really quite amazing and, and I feel you know fully supported in in that and, and sharing that information. I'm I'm feeling mostly okay it is there there are moments when I'm very um, sad about things I think I'm gonna miss in the future. Um, I'm off. <laughs> And that's not something that I'm thinking about loads, but there will be something that happens and I will just think I probably won't be at that thing that's going to happen or... So we've just had a family wedding. <laughs> and I have just realised during that process that I might not see my baby get married. <laughs> and that's been really hard. Um, 
for, for anybody else who's thinking um, about going through genetic testing, I think the, the thing that I would say is to be really honest with everybody about why you want to do it. Um, don't keep it to yourself. That's, I really thought that's what I was going to do um, and very quickly changed my mind about that. Know that it is your decision. So if someone in your family thinks that you, if someone in your family thinks that you shouldn't have it done, that is, they can feel that way. But if you feel that it's the right thing for you, but um, just talk to people. Um, know that you can change your mind at any time. Know that when you hear the result, think very carefully about how when you hear the result, you can't ever unhear it and think very, very carefully about it. And t talk to other people, I think that's, if, if you can talk to anybody who's been through that process, I think that is even more significant because you can get a really um, first-hand experience of how it was for one person. And it's not to say that it would be the same for you, but I think just keep talking, I think is the most important thing. Um, talk to the people that matter and trust yourself in your decision making. The things that helped me really were making sure that my husband and my daughter understood the implications of me knowing and understood why I really needed to know, why it was really important to me. Um, and that they were prepared because I think I would always have been more prepared for for the not great result um, than them. And just know that if you're getting a genetic result, that is just telling you that you have that gene mutation and, and what the outcome of that will be. You don't immediately have to give up driving or, or any of those things. I got back and I just went for a drive and I thought, should I even be driving? <laughs> but I was fine driving the day beforehand. Um, just remember that, that the day that you find out, if you do find out that you have it, you are exactly the same person that you were and able to do exactly the same things as you were that morning when you woke, woke up before you found out. It doesn't change like that. You go through the whole process keeping a lid on it. So you keep a lid on it so you can go to work. You keep a lid on it so that you can talk to other people, almost in a nonchalant way. Everything's a bit blasé, you know. And even the people who you tell about having the test, you are quite matter of fact because some of them will say, oh, I don't know how you could do that. Why are you having that done? Why, why are you going ahead with that? Mm -hmm. So sometimes I suppose it's other people's reactions. So you get quite used to keeping a lid on it bottling it all down, shoving it all back in the drawer, closing that drawer in your head and carrying on with normal life. But actually that's what you've been doing for your whole life because that's the way you keep on going. Because if you stop doing that, how are you going to keep on going? So, but when you're on your own, sat in a room at night time and you're crying and you're thinking about, you know, the fact that life could change and be very different for your children and for your husband, um, when you get your result, all of that pain and all of that emotion that you've experienced, all of that bundling up and shoving back in the drawer that you've been doing for the past year, that still needs to come out. And if you don't ever let it out, then I suppose that might be where the sort of the depression and the kind of like, oh God, you know, I don't really know how I should feel now comes in because it's constantly bubbling, but you're constantly trying to keep your glass just balance so it doesn't topple over and at some point I suppose you do that would be my advice allow your glass to topple over you know just allow it to kind of to to just express how you feel because otherwise um yeah you, you constantly keep a lid on it and that's hard all the time to do that so yeah I sat and I cried for quite a long time actually even though I've got good good news a good result for me you know a, well a non carrier result. Yeah, it's quite strange really. I think it's important to know that everybody is going to deal with the process and with the results if they choose to get them in in a really different way. So hearing how other people have done it, I think it's really good for you to, to hear that, but also to know 
that you might react to whatever the result is in a, in a completely different way to them. And that's also okay. Everybody is going to deal with this very differently. Um, there is no there is no right or wrong way. Staying in bed for a couple of months is all right if you need to do it.